with me for about five, maybe ten minutes, as those who are streaming and joining us realize that last week you didn't get to join us. And it's not even recorded last week. So uh, I got uh, a couple phone calls and then uh, one particular, I don't know if it was an email or a phone call, asking would I repeat today what I said last week. <laughs> and I did this before one time when it didn't come out that I, I, can, I can give you a, a quick a review of what we studied last time. Uh, and for a scripture reading, we'll just read uh, Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, and then I, I'm going to explain. Uh, I just highlighted my notes from last week, and it, it actually leads into our study of this week. And for everybody, you know, I, I thought to myself, especially with the streaming people joining us, there, we have a small group here on Wednesday that are coming out. Our Sunday is growing. Our Wednesday is not too much growing, but uh, we've got a faithful group here. But I thought to myself, would I be teaching what I'm teaching here about the angels that sinned if I, you know, like when we did the funeral on Sunday, uh, Saturday, we were at a Nazarene church, and, you know, the, the assembly size was more than double ours. And uh, so there's quite a few people out there, and I was thinking, you know, some pastors, when they teach on Wednesday, have a huge audience. And would I be teaching this subject to a huge audience of people? And I thought to myself, no, because it would be such a different degree. But then I said, no, I would, because if I've taught as many years as I have here, uh, that those people, you, even if you talk over the head of someone, there is pieces of information that they can put together. And... Uh, and so I, I think I would. Uh, we are looking at this quite closely, and that's because uh, I think we're, I'm dealing with a mature group, so I'm hoping that the, the streaming people are mature. And, uh, and, and the most of all, what I'm seeing more and more is as we talk about, even though we're back in the, the angels that sin start out in Genesis 6, we read that last week to open up. But in, in, in looking at that, everything that we're seeing concerning angelic things, and whether it be the fall of Satan, the angels that sinned, and, and so forth, that all of it sheds additional light on the revelation of the mystery given to the Apostle Paul. Because the church, the body of Christ, has to do with the reconciling of the heavens. And the things we're studying here, we're learning, as Job said, the heavens are not pure in his sight. And uh, he's charged his angels with, with folly, it says. And uh, and so uh, the, these things are beneficial, and I think they actually help us understand the dispensation of grace and what God's accomplishing in the age of grace. And I've been concluding that way, and, and I, I think that uh, it is helpful. Um, before I read the scriptures, we, we started out last week just talking. We read Genesis 6, 1 through 7, and I said clearly, even though I didn't prove it, that when it talks about the sons of God came down to the daughters of men and took them wise, all of which they chose, and eventually it reads about giants being born unto them, that some disagree, but I am convinced, and not like when we talked about Satan, when he fell and all that, I am absolutely convinced that the sons of God that came down to the daughters of men are angels. They came down to human women and produced uh, an offspring of giants in the earth. Now we'll eventually get to why I say that and, and use that as proof, uh, but I started out just declaring that. Then we talked about reviewing some of the stuff that we said. One of the clear statements we talked about, that, that when we talk about angels, the Bible talks about the angels of heaven, because heaven, they were made to dwell in the heavens. When we talk about uh, man on the earth, the Bible calls a man of the earth. Uh, even Paul says uh, man is earthy, <laughs> because he's made of the earth. And, uh, and we were reading the verses that the earth was made for the children of men. So the angels are angels of heaven, and the earth is made for man, and, and the Bible declares that, and we were looking at the verses above that. Then we said that we've already looked at and realized that there was a fall that took place among the heavenly creatures. And so we talked about, the reviewed about Satan. One thing that I want the streaming video to realize what we did is we looked at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, and Jude verse 6, where it talked about the angels that sinned, uh, how they left their first estate, and they are now reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So that, I, I, I said that I believe that the, the angels that sinned, that left their first estate, are the ones that we read about in Genesis 6, and that those, those angelic beings are in everlasting chains of darkness, 
and they're reserved unto the judgment of the great day, as that said. The reason I bring that up is Matthew chapter 8 and verse 29, we read the, the, the place where Jesus is casting out demons, and the demons in the man ask the Lord, are you come to torment us before our time? So they know there's a great day of judgment coming, but these angels are not chained. The, these are angels that fell, so they're Satan's angels, uh, and, and they know they get, there's a judgment coming, but those angels are free. And, uh, and, and so there's some angels that are chained away and other fallen angels that are free. So that was important to know. Then we started talking about the fall of man. Went back to Genesis 3, and just a couple points there is how Eve wasn't resistant to talk to the serpent when he showed up. However Satan showed up as that serpent, there's a being there that she's talking to that wasn't strange to her. She knew something about him. When he said, ye shall be as the gods, knowing good and evil, she didn't say, who are the gods? She knew that he is a reference to angelic beings who know something about evil that she didn't know. So that she's very familiar, Adam and Eve were very familiar about the angelic beings. And, uh, and when they sinned, uh, God said, and this is where we are, Genesis 3.14, the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, and art, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shall thou go, and dust shall they eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, the seed of the woman, will bruise the head of Satan, not his seed, but the head of Satan himself, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So that that's, this is an important part to our whole doctrine. Eventually we'll get back to Romans 6, but there's some things we want to look at first. This idea that Satan used the woman to cause Adam to disobey God and bring sin into the world. So God just simply tells Satan that he's going to use the woman, put enmity between Satan and the woman, between Satan's seed and her seed, and her seed is going to destroy Satan. And Satan's seed is going to actually bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, which is ultimately is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, we're going to look at that today, but we pointed or just mentioned that last week. And that enmity exists. And what we said is that Genesis 3.15 is, is, is the first preaching of the gospel in the sense that we who live on this side of the cross see exactly how that was fulfilled. All they see is that God's going to destroy the power of Satan. As it said in Hebrews, destroy him that had power over death, that is the devil. We looked at all those verses last week. But we see exactly how that was done, how that's a picture of the cross, where on the cross the heel of Jesus Christ was bruised. But it's the cross is the means by Satan is destroyed. And, uh, and the victory that comes because of the cross, Satan, his power is destroyed and ultimately he'll bring to his final destruction. That the salvation for man is in these verses, but they're going to come through a man that's going to be the seed of the woman. And we kept reading verses about the man Christ Jesus and why Jesus Christ became a man. Then we actually concluded last time by saying that never was any such love shown to angels as it is to man. When we say that God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, there's no angel that said, even though I've fallen and I've sinned, Christ died for me. Because he didn't. Those verses in Hebrews, he became a man, he died for man. And the angels don't know God the way we can know God, personally or by Christ dying for them. But when you read Paul's epistles and realize that in the ages to come, that God's going to use the body of Christ to show the exceeding riches of his kindness toward us in his grace, that it's in us that the angels, who the Bible says were lower than the angels, See Jesus Christ becoming lower than the angels and dying for mankind, commending his love to these creatures that are below angels, bringing salvation to mankind, and now they see the love of God because of what he's done for man. And so again, you, get, you start getting the picture of Paul, in Paul's epistles of what God's teaching angels by the body of Christ, where they get to learn some things that were that was never showed to them, but now they know some things about God because of what's been showed to us. Now everything that we said was to show that this enmity between Satan and the woman. He used the woman to bring, to deceive, or to get Adam to sin. She was deceived. Adam deliberately disobeyed. Sin came into the world. But God's going to use that same woman 
to bring salvation because he's going to bring a seed of a woman about. And that is going to be, that seed of the woman is going to destroy Satan. So what we're going to do, and it's important whether you, many times this is a, a, a Bible study that hopefully mature people have been through several times. Uh, maybe I'll show some verses that you never connected to this. And actually, if we would get to real big detail, we could go through almost every book of the Bible and show this enmity between Satan and the woman between what the Bible calls his seed, and we'll talk about his seed later, but we're going to first focus on this seed of the woman and this battle that's going to go about. So, Genesis chapter 4. In verse 1, it says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Now that statement, I have gotten a man from the Lord, seems to indicate that she was remembering that the Lord said there was going to be a seed of a woman, and now Cain's born to her, and I've gotten a man from the Lord. It, 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 to her, it's almost like a, an expression of, could this be the seed? And uh, as you know, it's not the seed. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, she, she's looking at that as a seed that came from God, and, and certainly looking for that solution to sin that came into the world, but it's not going to be through Cain. Uh, in fact, the next verse 2 says, again, uh, she again bare uh, his, son, his brother, Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So there's Cain and Abel, and as you, without going through the story, you know that uh, when it comes time to bring a, an offering to the Lord, Cain brings of the fruit of the ground, uh, the uh, yeah, the fruit of the ground, things that he grew, tried to offer that to the Lord. Rather than a blood sacrifice, and his offering was not accepted, out of jealousy, he kills his brother Cain, who brought a more excellent sacrifice than, than Cain. He killed his brother Abel, who brought a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. So, Cain and Abel are born, and we already pointed out the fact that Adam knew Eve, and that's how Cain came about, so don't get into the superstitious stuff. And it does look like when verse 2, it doesn't say he knew her again, it almost looks like they're twins. And that's something I'll point out to you as we go through the book of Genesis, these twins and how God is always taking the second. But it's not Abel who's going to be the, the seed line that, that the, the Savior of the world's going to come through because Cain killed him, and that would certainly, if he's the one that represented God and the truth of God, then that gets wiped off the earth, except that when you come over to chapter 4 in verse uh, 25, it says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel whom Cain slew. <laughs> so Seth replaces Abel as someone who does honor God. And then to Seth, uh, to him also there was born a son and called his name Enos. Then began men to call on the name of the Lord. So they're, they're realizing Enos is mortal. They're realizing they're going to die. But they're calling on the Lord to save them. But that seed uh, uh, that was as it says there, that uh, God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel. She's looking at the seed. There's going to be a seed that's going to come, and she's looking at Seth as maybe that seed. So there is a seed line that God promised, and they're looking forward to that as you look at that. When you go through Genesis chapter 5, all the way from 1 to verse 32, you have, Noah, you have Adam all the way to Noah, and you're working your way to Noah's son, as verse 25, 32 says. And Noah had fought, lived 500 years, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So you're working your way from Adam all the way to Noah, and to Noah's son Shem, as we'll, we'll pick up there. But in that flood, look over in chapter 9. In verse 7, after they get off the ark, it says... And you be fruitful, and multiply, and bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, be, uh, behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you. So this promise, this promised seed is going to continue to come about. Now, not just, it's, we can trace it from Adam all the way down to Noah, and as you pick up in, in chapter 10, you're going to pick up with uh, the line of Shem that's going to eventually lead to, to Abraham. But before we leave here, look at verse 24. 
chapter 9, verse 24. It says, uh, And of Arkstad begot Selah, and Selah begot Eber, and unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, uh, for in his day was the earth divided, and his brother's name was jo uh, Joktan, and Joktan begot Elmadad, and uh, Shelah, I'm not even sure I'm reading the right verses, that's why I'm hesitating. No, I'm not reading the right verses. I want, yeah, I want you in nine. Okay. <laughs> I'm thinking, why am I going through that? <laughs> okay, chapter 9, verse 24. And Noah awoke oh, from, his, from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. And he cursed Canaan, uh, the servant, uh, and uh, he cursed. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, uh, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Now, we, we might talk a little bit about that cursing upon Canaan. But the really point of reading this is what he just says in verse 26. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. You see how God is associated with Shem. And Canaan shall be his servant, and God, enlar uh, God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be a servant. So Canaan is servant, but when it says the Lord God of Shem, you can see the godly lineage there this seed line is going to be able, you're going to be able to follow it from Shem uh, to alt ultimately our goal is to, to all the way down to the Lord Jesus Christ. But from Shem you have a list in Genesis chapter 10. Then that's going to take you to Abraham, and then uh, so you, you got it's uh, chapter 10. You're going to pick up in verse 10, and you're going to follow the lineage of Shem. And you get down to verse 29 and 30, it says, And Abram and Nahor uh, took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of uh, Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of uh, 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 Iskar, Iska, and, and Sarah bear, uh, was barren, and she had no child. But my point is, in verse 28, you got Terah, which is Abraham's father, and then you got Abraham, so that you're tracing the lineage from the Lord God of Shem down to Abraham, and then hopefully you're familiar that when you come to Genesis chapter 12, God separates out Abraham from the other nations, and he says in verse 2, I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Verse 7, it says it this way, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give the land. Uh, and, there, uh, and there he built an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So you got this seed now is going to come through Abraham. And, uh, and there's a story on you know, how long it takes for Abraham to finally have a, the son that God appoints for him, Isaac. And then Isaac has Jacob and Jacob has 12 uh, sons which become the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. But the point is, as we started out with Adam and Eve, and there, we're going to look for, out of mankind is going to come a seed of a woman. Actually, out of womankind is going to come the seed of the woman that's going to destroy Satan. Well, as you start tracing that down, when you get to Noah, he has three sons, but now we know to look through the line of Shem, that that's going to be the line that this seed is going to come through. And then God, out of the nations that multiply after the flood, God separates Abraham from the other nations, and it's now through his seed. So now you've taken mankind as he multiplies, and now you know what nation to look for that the seed is going to come through. And then Abraham has Isaac, Isaac has Jacob, and as I said, and they have 12 sons. Come over to chapter 25. Here's another twin, because <laughs> Jacob was a twin. In verse uh, 22, it says, it says, And the children struggled together within her, and, and she... Uh, and, uh, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. The one people shall be the stronger, and the other people, uh, and the other pe stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. 
the one that's going to have the heritage of God is going to be the younger child. So Esau is born first, and then after him is Jacob. Twins are born, but the firstborn is Esau, but yet it's going to be the younger. The elder is going to serve the younger. The younger is the one that we need to watch for, this seed to come through that God is going to bless and bring salvation to the world. And uh, so as we think about that, there's some other details I want to give you. Come over with me to chapter 38. Now it says in chapter 38, verse 1, And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned into unto a certain Dolomite, whose name was Hira. And, and Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was uh, Shea, she, Shu, Shula. And, and he took her and went in unto her, and she conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Ur. And she conceived again, and bare a son, and she called his name uh, Onan. And, and she yet again conceived, and bare a son, and called his name Selah. And he was, uh, he was at uh, Chizub when she bare him. And Judah took, the wife, uh, took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamara. And Ur, Judah's, uh, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up a seed unto thy brethren. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his, that is, it would be actually as a seed to his brother, and it came to pass, when he went in unto, her, unto his brother's wife, that he spilled it on the ground, lest he should give seed unto his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. Now, you know, a lot of people read that and say, see, God's against birth control. But if you're understanding that there is this promised seed that God has promised, then there is a special seed line that's going to come through Abraham, and, and certainly Satan would be against that seed, and here a person has an opportunity perhaps to be that seed, and rather than have a seed unto his brother, he makes sure he doesn't get the, his, that, his brother's wife pregnant. And God slew, slew him for it. So what I'm saying is, rather than looking at this and saying, see, God's against all matter of birth control, you need to understand this seed that's been promised, that we're watching Scripture to pass down, so you would understand the depth of the sin that he did. Now, whether or not he knew at this time, it doesn't matter. It's going to come through the nation of Israel. But I want you to see something else. We're going to come back to chapter 38. But come with me to chapter 49. Now, chapter 49, you have this long section in, at the end of the book of Genesis that's all about Joseph's life. Right after he starts about Joseph's life and how he's sold into Egypt, you have this chapter 38 that talked about what Judah did. And you, why, you know, why is that inserted in there? That's really an insertion. You begin to understand that after Jacob is brought to Egypt where he's going to die, that he ultimately blesses his sons. And in chapter 49 in verse, well, read 1 to 12 so you can see the importance of this. It says, And Jacob called unto his sons, and said, Gather yourselves together, and I will tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. So he's going to speak as a prophet. Gather yourselves together, and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, and my, uh, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, thou shalt, uh, thou shalt not excel. Because thou wentest up unto thy father's bed, and defiled, uh, defiled thou it, he went, uh, he went up to my, my couch. Now, if you just write down Genesis chapter 35, 22, Reuben went to one, J Jacob had four wives. 
and he actually went into one of the concubines. He had two wives, and then their their servants became Jacob's wives as well. He went to Bil, Bilda, Bildad, and uh, he went into, we would call it his aunt, and and that's his father's wife. And, and so he says, even though you're my firstborn, he's not going to get the blessing of the firstborn. He, he lost it. So you read verse 5. Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitation. O my soul, come not thou unto their secret, unto the, their assembly, mine, uh, mine, unto their assembly, mine honor, be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and, their, uh, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Rube, the, the next two in line, as far as his eldest, are si, uh, Simeon and Levi. If you write down Genesis chapter 34, verse 25... <laughs> They have a sister, Dana, who a man wanted to marry her. She actually, he actually slept with her. But, and the, the, so they met, and, and, and Jacob and the sons of, of uh, Jacob all told these men of this land, if you and everybody in your land get circumcised, we'll let you marry my sister. And so they agreed. They went back to the land. Every, all the men agreed, okay, we'll get circumcised. You get circumcised, you're part of the circumcision of Israel. So they all get circumcised. While they were sore, Simeon and Levi went in and killed every male in the city because of what they did to their sister. And after they made this agreement, they and their anger did this, they're, they're disqualified from being the heir of Jacob. So then you keep reading. You come to verse uh, 8. Judah... Thou art he that thy brother shall praise, thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemy, thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Sounds like this guy's going to get enthroned. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, as an old lion. Who shall arouse, rouse, rouse, rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah nor the lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Uh, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be, bring, bringing his foal unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his cloth in the blood of grapes. Almost looks like the Lord riding in on the donkey and dying for sin. It says, his eyes shall be red with wine, there's a second coming, and his teeth white with milk. Whatever all that symbolism is, what's real clear in verse 10, the scepter shall not depart out of Judah, a lawgiver from between his feet. The, the, the promised seed line that's going to bring salvation is going to be now, we've, we've taken it from mankind, and now we know that it's going to come through the nation of Israel. But Israel had 12 sons, now we know which son it's going to come through. It's going to come through Judah. Interesting, the ones who get disqualified, there's all kinds of sexual sins there, isn't there? But even Judah, all things, back there, go back to chapter 38. Judah had the three sons, two of them are now dead. And it says in verse 11, it says, Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in thy father's house till uh, Shelah, my son, be grown, for he... Uh, for he saith, lest peradventure he die also, at his, uh, 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 as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. So she got to wait for this third son to grow up so that he could actually come in and then have a child. And ultimately, we now know by going ahead and looking at that, this is going to be the seed line that's going to be the, the, have the scepter. Uh, it's going to come through Judah. So what happens in the process of this, <laughs> look over in verse 15. It says, and Judah saw her, and he, what it is, his wife dies. He takes a trip, and he sees Tamar, but he doesn't recognize she's disguised herself. And it says, and Judah saw her, he thought to, uh, her to be a harlot, because she had covered her face. And he turned in unto her by the way, and said, go to, I pray thee, 
let me come in unto thee, for he knew not it was uh, she was his daughter-in-law. She, uh, and she said, will, what wilt thou give me that thou mayest come in unto me? So he gives her a bracelet and, and stuff, and he says, I'll come back and pay you. So he goes in under her as a harlot. She's got this down payment. He sends a servant back, and, and the servant comes to that land and says, uh, where's that harlot? Uh, you know, got to pay her back. And they said, there's no harlot here. And he goes back. He says, <laughs> they said, there's no harlot there. So he, he doesn't know how to pay her back. So, but she took that pledge from him. If you come over to verse, I'm trying to jump through this, uh, verse 24. It says, And it came to pass that about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot, and also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth, uh, let her be burned. <laughs> so she ends up pregnant. Well, we know how she got pregnant. And so eventually she has to disclose to him how it is that she became pregnant. And so over in verse, keep losing my place here, uh, 27. It says, uh, no, I read, yeah, verse 27, it says, uh, And it came to pass in the time of her travail that she, that behold, twins were in her. Now, anyhow, what she does is when he has come to her, he, she exposes, I'm pregnant by the one who, the bracelet, maybe I remember what else there was? Oh, and his staff. That's who I'm pregnant by, and it was his. So he realized she was more righteous than he because he never gave her the, the son that grew up. So eventually, here's what I want to get to. It came to pass in, uh, in the time of her travail that behold, twins were in her womb. We keep seeing these twins. And it came to pass when she travailed that the one put out his hand and the midwife uh, took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread saying, this came out first. So the one with the thread, that's the firstborn. And it came to pass, as he drew his hand back, that behold, his brother came out. <laughs> and she said, How hath this bro broken forth? This breach is upon thee, therefore his name is called Ferris. And afterwards came out his brother, and he had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was Zorah, called Zorah. So Zorah is the firstborn, but Ferris is the secondborn, and Ferris is the one through which... The seed line is going to come through Judah, and now is going to come through Ferris. Come over to the book of Ruth. The end of the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 4. Sometimes we don't like genealogies, <laughs> but they're in the Bible for a reason. Ruth is just before 1 Samuel. And you, you'd understand why when you read this conclusion. Ruth is a, a Moabite who eventually married a man in Israel named Boaz. And even though he was an older man, he was a relative. And therefore, she, could, he, she was married to a Jew. And now she could, if he comes in under her, then he's, she's going to bear children to, to Boaz. And she does. And when you get to the end of, of, of the book of Ruth, in verse 18, it says, Now these are the generations of Pharisees. Pharis begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Abinadab, and Abinadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salomon, and Salomon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed, and Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. <laughs> so we realize Judah has a, chi a child with his daughter-in-law, but that scepter wasn't going to depart from Judah, and here is Pharis, and Pharis is related to David. And Boaz is actually, what, the great-grandfather of David? And, uh, uh, yeah, Boaz begot Obed, and Obed begot Jesse. So that's the grandfather, so he's the great-grandfather. Uh, so what you have in the book of Ruth is the genealogy of David. And, and then here comes David. Well, David is the one that that scepter, he's going to become the king, and that seed is going to come through him, come to 2 Samuel chapter 7. In verse 12, 2 Samuel 7, verse 12, the Lord speaking through Nathan the prophet to him and says, 
And when thy days be fulfilled, that thou shalt sleep with thy father, and I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish his throne and his kingdom forever. So this is not going to be Solomon. <laughs> it's going to be a seed that's going to be even beyond Solomon. And, if his and, and I will be his father, and he will be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men. And with the stripes of the children of men, but my mercy shall not depart from him. Solomon did fail. But God is not going to take it away as he took it away from Saul. That lineage is not, it's going to be through David. Uh, he says, uh, uh, from whom Saul I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. And thy throne shall be established forever. So God is now talking and saying, okay, David, your seed, I'm going to establish his throne forever. So now, not only do we know it's not out of all the nations, it's going to be through Israel. Out of all the tribes in Israel, it's going to be through Judah. All the families in Judah, it's going to be through David. So we're narrowing the seed line all the way down to David. Now, by the way, I can jump all the way to the New Testament now. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, it said, The book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So there comes the Lord Jesus Christ, and it starts tracing from Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah and his brethren, and Judah begot Pharaoh. <laughs> there we go. So we, we got the list that's connecting the Old Testament and then bringing all the way up to Jesus Christ. He's both the seed of David, the seed of Abraham. If you look over in verse... Um, Well, they changed the name, so it's hard for me. Uh, well, anyhow, I'm not going to go there. I just was going to mention to you, but I, I can't see it. That, oh, there it is, verse 11. Uh, and jo Joaz begot Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. If you would read the Old Testament, you'd find out God cursed that line, that no king from Jeconias is going to reign on the throne. So it looked like the seed got messed up because as we keep tracing this genealogy, go down to verse 16, and Jacob, we're going, working our way from Abraham back and uh, or up to the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. So we found out that as you go through this genealogy, that the genealogy is going from David to Abraham and working our way all the way up to Joseph, the husband of Mary, but Jesus is not of Joseph. Because as you got in this chapter, uh, it says, uh, uh, verse 21, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now this was all done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet of the Lord, uh, spoken by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. The point is, is what you're reading here is Joseph is realizing Mary is going to show up pregnant. But it's going to be the fulfillment of Isaiah. A virgin is going to have a child. Now, why did God say the seed of the woman? We've been tracing the seed line of man, and when it comes to Joseph... Joseph didn't begot Jesus. <laughs> he is actually, he's actually born of Mary, a virgin, but yet he's got to be related to David for that, for that purpose of that seed line. So if you come over to Luke chapter 3, now some people find this hard. I, you might not see it the way I see it. But you have uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in his lineage in the book of Luke. And what you're going to do is you're going to go from Jesus Christ all the way back to Abraham, or to David, all the way back to Abraham, all the way back to Adam. And so it's going to start with Jesus Christ and go back. Matthew actually started back and worked its way forward. But 
point this out. In verse 23 it says, And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. Now that verse, people thought he was the son of Joseph. But he's not the son of Joseph, was he? When it says, which was the son of Heli, he's not the son of Joseph, he is the son of Heli. Because Heli is Mary's father. And they're going to trace the genealogy through Mary back. And you know that's true because every person born has two genealogies. Through their father and through their mother. And the point is, is this, whoever this Heli is, you're going to trace the genealogy from Jesus Christ to Heli, and you're going to start going back in time. And if you keep following that back, look at verse 31. He says, which is the, the son of uh, Mila, Mila, which was the son of Meman, which is the son of Mahamath, which is the son of Nathan, which is the son of David, which is the son of Jesse, which is the son of of Dave, uh, the son of uh, which is the son of Obed, which is the son of Boaz, which is the son of Saul. Well, I skipped David. Verse thirty-one is the son of David. My point is, if you would look close, and I probably passed it up when we were in Matthew, when you would trace Matthew's genealogy to Joseph, the one that you hit David is Solomon. You go from Solomon to David. In this genealogy, you go from Nathan to David, a different son of David. So this is a different genealogy. Mary's related to David as well. And, and so you reach Jesus Christ through Mary, through Nathan, not through Solomon, but he is the son of David. And because he was actually born of Mary, so you keep going then back and you keep working your way back all the way to uh, Abraham. And then finally, as you conclude, it says uh, verse uh, 37, which is the son of uh, Methuselah which is the son of Enoch, which is the son of Jared, which is the son of uh, Meliam, no, Melia, <laughs> which is the son of Canaan, which is the son of Enos, which is the son of Seth, which is the son of Adam, which is the son of God. So the genealogy goes back from, it traces from Jesus Christ back to David, back to Abraham, even back to Adam. And, uh, and it's through a different lineage than Matthew because this is the lineage of Mary. So you have Jesus Christ then becoming that seed of the woman that was promised. And he's the one that's going to be the promise. When the Lord said, now, you know, you got that passage over there, there's going to be enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. And strange thing, women don't have a seed. But when God puts a seed in Mary, it's his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the seed of the woman who's now going to come and destroy the serpent and bring salvation to mankind. I say that to you because as you study that seed, there's a tax on that seed in many, many places. We looked at some of those just along the way to realize that there's trying to hinder the seed of the woman and even that if we would have studied about uh, uh, Jeconias and, uh, and the sin that he committed that God said no one from his throne is going to prosper on the throne, and, uh, and yet Joseph is related to him, but Jesus Christ is not of the seed of Joseph. He is the seed of the woman who's the one that can bring salvation. Now that actually is important for you to study your Bible to realize that there is this promised seed that goes back to Genesis 3:15 and turns up in Jesus Christ and there's no one else because he's the only one born of a virgin and then he fulfills that prophecy where his heel is bruised but on that cross, he becomes the means by which Satan is defeated. Um, in a closing verse, come with me to Colossians chapter 2. Now you'll see, as we go back to Genesis 6 later on, there's something, a couple other things, one other thing we've got to study before we go back to Genesis 6, that it's important to follow this promise of the seed. And, uh, and then... And then what we're going to do next week is I, I do want to say some things about what is the seed of the serpent? Because there's a lot of talk about that. And I don't know that I have all the answers, but I have some answers. I got some Bible verses that we're going to look at. But we know that the seed of the woman is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that he is the one who is going to destroy Satan. So in Colossians chapter 2, it says, it says uh, verse 14, 
blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Spoiled principalities and powers means that you robbed them of their riches. You, have, you get a taste of that if you look at verse chapter 1. And it says in verse 12, thanks, be, be, uh, thanks, giving thanks unto the Father who hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom, in his Son, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And he's writing that to Gentiles. <laughs> That even us Gentiles are saved because of what Jesus Christ did and were transferred from the power of darkness. We were part of the kingdom of Satan and were translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And in that, in that transfer, verse 15 of chapter 2 says, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he robbed Satan of his wealth. <laughs> and that is, there was, there was only one nation on this earth that belonged to God and they wanted to be like us Gentiles. <laughs> That one nation was Israel, and they're failing God. But Satan had all the Gentile nations. But the cross became the means by which God goes back into the Gentile world and brings salvation, taking people out of the power of Satan into his own kingdom. And so he's spoiling principalities and powers. He made a show of them. That is, he showed they don't have power. They don't have the ability. They have been destroyed. They have been defeated. He triumphed over them in it. In what? The cross. That is, that what it says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances which was against us, took it, uh, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And that cross became the means by which he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in the cross. So that seed of the woman has provided the means by which Satan is destroyed. Now, we can talk later about whether he actually knew it at this time. He certainly realizes he has no power to stop people from being saved except for deceiving them and blinding them to the gospel. But God's grace can save even the chief of sinners. And that cross becomes the means by which Satan is destroyed. His power is defeated. And, uh, and ultimately, he'll lose his place in heaven because the purpose of the body of Christ has to do with God's purpose in the heavenly places as we keep relating to, and which I think is really what we can learn even when we go back there in Genesis 6 and learn some things about angels. So anyhow, that's the seed of the woman that destroyed the serpent. And then we'll talk about the seed of the serpent a little bit next week and then go back to Genesis chapter 6. I think all these pieces of information will fall together for you, but we'll, we'll wait and see how it works for you. It works for me. <laughs> Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do thank you for the time spent. Um, could be a review for some of us. Certainly all those little details about uh, that seed line in the book of Genesis. And, and certainly Cain was a failure. And, uh, and those early sons of, of Judah were failures. And even Judah and his sinfulness doesn't stop the fact that you're going to bring salvation for sinners through that seed line that is through Judah and then through David and of the seed of the woman, of, of the Virgin Mary, the Lord Jesus Christ, who did defeat Satan and the powers of darkness by the cross. Father, help us to tell others so that they can be translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of your Son for your eternal purpose and glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.